We're jumping live because we got a big raid. Oh, this song is called The Raid. That's fun. <laughs> hey, that's nice. nice. Oh, sorry. No, that was me. Oh, I did. Yeah. Justin did it as per usual. Hello, everybody. The Weird Things show is going to start here in just a few moments. How's everybody doing? Oh, man. V good. V good. Very excited. Yeah. I had a, I had a dream that uh, Jimmy Carter was my college professor and that he had a Saturday morning cartoon show where his wacky gang of characters was sentient southern food dishes and the most popular character was Poe Boy. Really? Yeah. Who were the other who were the other options? I can't remember. I think there was some fritter, but like like there was there was one Scooby and a lot of Freds. Like, mm. you know, the Po Boy was the Po Boy was the star. And like it was Jimmy Carter was more of um like a like a uh uh whoever the adult lady was in Muppet Babies. It was like kind of that role. Like he wasn't uh -huh. like the Miss Frizzle, like he was more he like was he just wasn't instigating feet. action. Well, yeah, it was no, you saw him, but mm -hmm. he was always more like, Well, Po boy, calm down. Like <laughs> just mm -hmm. something like that and less of a like he's gonna give the lesson at the end and not like, you know, be the one who decides that there's an adventure to go on. I see. Uh, I see. But anyway, I, I think that that is the sign that I'm I'm prepared to cover the Democratic <laughs> National Convention. That's right. That's our when tonight, I'm having isn't it? when I'm having Jimmy Carter dreams. Mm -mm. So, hey, Andrew. Look, just trying to think, what does a convention mean now? Uh, oh, we're gonna find out. We have no idea. Uh, a, a bunch of YouTube videos. I think it's a YouTube playlist. Yeah, it's basically like a TikTok channel. You know. Basically. Yeah. Uh, the the good news is it'll probably end on time, uh, unlike regular conventions that <laughs> wind up going late into the night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I literally did. I tweeted that out just so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> like the idea of Jimmy Carter having like a Saturday morning cartoon with a wacky, uh -huh. sentient po' boy sandwich uh, was something that I, I I couldn't bear to let slip into the ether. Mm -mm. Uh, there's Brian Brushwood who is uh, joining us on the stream here. Just a moment. Oh yeah, we haven't had the captions on in a while. Let me see, I can put those back on. Let's see, hello everybody. How was your weekend, Andrew? Uh, my weekend was uh good. A uh, little bit of working, a little bit of relaxing. Yeah. Can you can you tap your mic for me, um, Andrew? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we can just, I probably adjusted the volume down a bit, but let me see. Uh, and there's oh, Brian. Way the F up. Oh, there we go. I sound better with my mic on. It, it's, it helps it's, a little it's, bit. It's to debatable. Do that. <laughs> better is a subjective I term. adjusted my volume, so maybe it's a little bit better sounding now. Uh, well, why don't you tell us how was your weekend? My weekend was involved in doing blank for blank, which would turned out to be really blank, which I'm glad I did blank. Ah, redacted. <laughs> um, yeah. How's that uh, redacted? Re redaction action. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I have, it's it, not like it, an official secret. I just haven't announced the fact that like on Twitter that I'm working for OpenAI. So it's sort of like, but like I've been, you know, doing that and then so um it's like a lot of my work oh, i can't talk about it but it's like oh it's because i just there's so much attention on that place right now so that's awesome i'm just sort of yeah playing yeah. down low i'm did uh i'm just more trying to sort of downplay because you know did i'm not a publicity secret, watch... guys i'm not no love lovecraft country i didn't was it good no. it's good i think it's good Made me uncomfortable. Um, hey, Brian, can you move your mic a little closer for me? Yeah. Yeah. 
cover more of my yeah there's a theme going through hbo shows dealing their genre and sci-fi shows i don't know what the theme is but it seems between that and Watchmen, (laughs) it seems like there's it's uh adapting older material that's what it is Mm. well the uh um I mean, we could talk about it on the show, but like on, on, on Watchmen, I felt like that was the background, the set piece, and you needed to be reminded of the stuff. But but knowing that Lovecraftian material was inherently racist from the beginning, it it it's not all of it, but it was made by an inherent racist. <laughs> correct, yeah, correct, yeah. correct, correct, correct. But but it's like it's like I'm like um, I'm like I'm sorry. Am I supposed to be scared of the mini bug eyed monster? compared to everything else you're showing me <laughs> like because one of the, one of these things is much scarier than the other <laughs> yeah the old ones jim crow laws living in you know this period of time i'm i'm, I'm... it was i know a, what the real threat is <laughs> uh it was a fun bit of almost like an arg to uh look up the wiki for sun for sundown cities uh oh, just dear. to look up oh uh, geez just yeah, to get yeah. a little more information and realize oh, we still might have a lot of them <laughs> effectively so. yeah you know um uh the good news compared to watchmen is uh i have way less reverence for lovecraft so maybe <laughs> i'll be able to to watch watch this and 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 w- enjoy it as a uh as as whatever meditation on race that they are that they're doing i'm more excited for that know what i would also be excited for just a story that's a meditation on race like you know i yeah. feel like you could tell a really it's not like these things are lacking drama you don't you don't need to add a wizard at the edge of town to tell a story about jim crow south that was the thing about like with watchmen i'm like let's let's do black wall street let's just do that story <laughs> instead of you know it's like uh, a side mention you know previously on uh, well, but shouts outs to the night of also an hbo a very good story if you're looking for a story about racial injustice uh though in mod- modern america um that one's pretty good it does it does sort of feel like somebody's offering me candy to come to church where it's like like uh, because you know if uh, a story about racial injustice i don't know that i'm gonna you know just leap out of the gates and be like i gotta watch this but if you tell me it's about monsters and it's set in H.P. Lovecraft times, I'll be like, okay, I'm in. And like, it also deals with the blatant, the blatant racism that he had. I'd be like, whatever, I'll pay that price. Let's go, you know. And then it's like you realize mm-hmm. you're in, in church. Did your church not have the person every week selling Krispy Kremes? Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I guess that's a <laughs> legit <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, I I I hear what you're saying. I guess that my I would say that not going to name any specific shows that we didn't get because it was a genre show. It was handled in sort of the genre way and the way we was presented to us wasn't as good as perhaps somebody who wanted to tell a really good story about that could really provide a better background and go, Oh, I, it's not just, let me substitute, you know, these, these, my villains for this, you know, it's, it's, I think I get, here's, here's my thing. Uh, if you're going to tell me that we can get six seasons out of an advertising agency in the sixties and the, like when the conflicts are, who's going to write this nylon copy on time, then you can tell a compelling story about the ND, NAACP lawyers that were going into Jim Crow South cities and defending black men because nobody else would defend them. Like there, there are really high tension pressure packed complicated characters that you can base on real world people and deal with real world cases that like i i think would be electric television um so i don't know i i i I, i'll watch it i was excited to see the 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 um the, the the commercial for it like it looked it looked good so i'm excited that uh well at least one of you guys liked it I mean, and, you know, and, a- and I'm not saying I didn't like it. I'm just saying, like, it, it challenged me in ways that I I uh, was not prepared to be challenged from what allegedly was a monster. It's, it's uh, the monster I, they, mash. Yeah, I they I mean, I mean, they were like in like the my side of stuff I'd read and they signaled heavily. Oh, it's this, this, this. And I was not like, ah, like, man, like, I would love a show just about that. And by the way, a good movie you pick if you ever saw was Mississippi Burning. 
which oh, yeah. was, uh, you know, a couple of civil rights workers just go missing. Yep. Go missing. It's trying to give people the right to vote. Don't what? Who? I have no idea who what, these guys. I mean, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll say that. this much and we'll talk about this more later on cord killers, but it's like, it's almost a relief when the crazy monsters show up. It's like, Oh good. I know where we are now. <laughs> Like, like I, I, I feel relief. Some of you are going to live. Some of you are going to die. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys want to do a podcast? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be sure. good. It's Fine. a good idea. Do a podcast here on the podcast site. All right. Here we go. I'm going to click some buttons and I'm going to catch you in, Andrew, in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello, everybody. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. So uh, I want to I want to start this off with sort of a, a thought that was started by one of our one of our team members here, who had a mm-hmm. crazy weird dream. Yes. You want me to, do, to tell to... the dream? All right. So here's yes. the deal. I had I had this very vivid dream. And on its face, it was a dream that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. I was in my senior year of college and I had not gone to any of my classes. And I was now wondering whether or not I was going to graduate. Uh, but one of my professors, uh, notice, he is history, not, notice he has not called it a nightmare yet. He's only <laughs> referred to this as a dream. And, I, and, and many of us have lived this dream. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I only, I hadn't even thought of that because in the past it would have been a nightmare, but I think I've had this dream so many times. Now I kind of enjoy it. It's like familiar. Uh, but yeah, so uh, despite the fact that I've graduated from college over a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, I still have these dreams. But the kindly history professor who was helping me figure out the path that I was going to be able to graduate was none other than former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter uh, in this world was still an ex-president and was so famous and popular that he had a currently running Saturday morning kid show, animated kid show, wherein his wacky uh, uh, cast of characters were all sentient Southern food dishes. uh, uh, And the most popular of which was Po' Boy. Po' Boy was the star of the show. Now, now sorry, uh, sorry, I actually don't know what goes into a Po' Boy. That that sounds like a meat thing, right? Uh, it's a sandwich. It's a it's a a New Orleans sandwich. So I'm sure Bryce can look up uh, pictures it's of like it, shrimp. But, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, seafood and whatnot. Yeah, like a seafood yeah. sub in two yeah, words. Okay, all right, all right. I'm with you. Uh, but but yeah. So Po' Boy was the star of the show, and I woke up this morning. And like you often have with these dreams, you have to realize certain things in order where it's like, oh, I graduated from college so many years ago. I don't have to worry about these credits that I've been worrying about in dream world. Oh, I didn't have a college professor, Jimmy Carter, who uh, and the most disappointing was that the Jimmy Carter Saturday morning animated cartoon show also didn't exist, which is why I had to tweet about it this morning. So I didn't lose it because the idea of Jimmy Carter's Saturday morning animated cartoon show with the wacky po' boy character was something that I, I mean, felt the world needed to know. I assume number four is, man, I could really go for a po' boy right now. Oh, baby, <laughs> could I? <laughs> Uh, there is something about the idea of the, the danger of like recording our dreams and then playing them back is probably realizing like like a high they just don't make any sense unless you're high, yeah. yeah. You know, because that's that's part of like some drugs they make you hallucinate connections between stuff like ah it meant something I'm like eh, maybe not maybe that's what the drug does is it makes you attribute meaning to things that don't have meanings. That being said, though, there are dreams that are super vivid and super real. Yeah, like the dream of the perfect po' boy. Justin, tell the truth. Did you have a po' boy today? I have not had a po' boy. I wouldn't even know where to get a good po' boy out here. Uh, You know, I guess like Popeye's is pretty much the only fast food place that does it. Um, Otherwise, yeah, I don't know if I would trust a a, a, a po' boy not in the south, not not south of the Mason-Dixon. I, uh... There was... 
I definitely woke up in the middle of the night, definitely hungry, definitely looked at the menu, definitely picked clam chowder, decided clam chowder, not interesting enough. Definitely poured soy sauce and clam chowder. Clam chowder? Regretted it. From a can? <laughs> yeah. Those don't go together. Now also, you also, love what soy about sauce. This story coming from me. <laughs> How much Sounds right, un- unreal. <laughs> like, right. I, mean, I mean, that's I, I, of of the dishes you eat in a week. Give me the percentage that involves you adding soy sauce. Oh, uh, I, I would say one in one in four. One in four. One in four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, like, I feel like I, that like is like something. I, uh, thing, things I will put soy sauce into. Uh, uh pizza. Just do 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 on pizza. It's great. On it's pizza or as like a like in a little ramekin and uh, you're dipping. No, no, no. Just just do 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 do. And then Ooh. throw that in there. And then um, mm-hmm. uh, 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 beef ravioli recently. Sure. I've, okay. I've discovered is is soy enhanced. Um, <sighs> turns out clam chowder was not one of my not best experiences. Too crazy. Not too crazy. Mm-mm. Nope. Which is funny is that you've done all that without like getting to ramen or like things that <laughs> traditionally people would like put soy sauce in. These are yeah. My, actually, my, my, my I, point I, is that I, you I think, are you are adventurous ramen with soy actually sauce. Actually, goes down with with soy sauce. What? It, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. You and you go, you, you have like the cup MSG noodle too, right? You throw extra MSG or maybe some ponzu sauce or something, but not soy. Wow. 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 Soy um, has a loud um, voice. In fact, if you want to get interesting. What you do with your ramen is you put whoosh in there, little Worcestershire sauce. Oh, uh. yeah. Uh, eh? Can I? Uh-huh. Can I show you? I just sent Bryce. There was a photo that somebody said this tweet like, "Oh, you think America's the greatest country? Check this out." And I'm already getting angry to be like, "How dare you tell me I don't live in the greatest country?" And then I saw this photo, and then I'm like, "Oh," and it was from Popeyes in South Korea. Oh, I'm already and excited. Bryce, you got the photo? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think this is the photo I, you meant to send, but I insist it be shown. No, I sent him two emails. There are two emails there. <laughs> you sent me two. Okay, well, this is the... Right. Well, I got yeah. this one. Which no, I no, show that later. Later, later. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, there I, we go. I see. <laughs> I check this out. I saw this, and I'm like, you won. You won. I'm questioning... The seven different chicken sandwiches they have at Popeyes in South Korea. Oh my god! Hot pepper roast, garlic burger, Cajun extreme, sweet thigh burger, Cajun tone oh. burger, cheese bacon <laughs> chicken burger, and chicken fillet burger. Wow! I will say this: when I was in Singapore, McDonald's had a spicy chicken sandwich that I have not been able to stop thinking about like they have like an, an exclusive thing in the asian market i guess that is that was awesome it was the closest thing that i've had brian the the, the wendy's spicy chicken sandwich yep the closest thing i've had from mcdonald's to that was in the asian market where they actually mixed the the breading was spicy and it wasn't like any kind of sauce on top yeah where are you at on the chick-fil-a spicy because i i think i'm backing away from it Eh. I think it's, it's it's too it's I think it's too spicy. I, I I don't like I don't like the it's the, it's, it's a pain in the butt. It's, I, uh, it's not Wendy's. I love going to McDonald's in other countries because like it was Singapore. I had the Ninja Burger. Oh, uh, you know, which is at McDonald's. They had a Ninja Burger with like the egg and everything else on top. It was crazy. Uh, India, uh, the the Big Mac tikka masala. It's like a it like a Tikka Masala Big Mac, and it's amazing. Oh. They have their peri peri fries. So, like, I love because people are like, oh, you go to McDonald's, other countries, you're so unsophisticated. I'm like, no, like, they make their own oh. menu there. And oh, it's yeah. amazing to see, you know, what passes elsewhere because, ah, it's this global brand, but, uh, you know, McDonald's somewhere else, it's like some of the staples are like very different. So, yeah, Justin, we think we, we've got video of your dream. Bryce found a live video <laughs> tap into this. And I don't know if we're able to be able to tap into this, but that is the idea. I love the idea of being able to basically uh, capture dreams. Yes. Here we so, are. We're logging in. We're diving into the... Oh, this is an ad. Ad. Okay. First, you're getting, you I, I, have I a commercial a in your head for Sundance, which is kind uh, of interesting. Capturing dreams, uh, partly because like there's a reason our brain scrubs dreams. Because like 
uh, uh, we do a lot of weird things in our dreams. We run simulations, we practice things that we're working on, uh, sometimes in real time, sometimes we mash up weird in, uh, you know, imagery to give us spontaneous new ideas. Um, but there's one thing that we absolutely do, or two things. One is our bodies freeze themselves because they know that no good will come of being able to move while we're having these dreams. And then the second thing we do is the moment we wake up, our brains, as fast as possible, tries to erase the whiteboard of everything that just happened overnight. And I have to feel like that happens for a reason. Yeah, I think that certainly, I mean, the idea that the part of our brain that forms longer term memories, you know, we, we don't do that. But I'm going to throw out kind of a crazy sort of theory here. What if being asleep is our natural state and being awake is just a thing we get do to get food and safety so we can be asleep? Oh, <laughs> what if this is wow. not the norm? But also being awake is where we gather all of the pieces to construct the minecraft of our wonderful dreamscapes shoot I yeah think but, you're that's, but that's me. yeah yeah because yeah we're just gathering nutrients so we can have a better moment of uh, uh building our own little world hmm. but then so, that maybe then what does that say like so our friend brett the amtrak around Seville is uh despite being a fairly uh, uh upbeat guy is also somebody who suffers from the most terrifying nightmares that I have ever heard in my entire life. That dude has horrifying dreams. So what does that say? Does Brett literally just lives to torture himself? <laughs> oh. If you know Brett, that's a fair answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can, I believe we've, we've tapped into the dream matrix yet again. Presidents <laughs> struck by a hurricane powered dose of radiation while appearing at a celebrity golf tournament. Our four former presidents are charged with powers and strength, rendering them all the more extraordinary. George Bush, read my lips, you're toast. Ronald Reagan, just say no to pissing me off. <laughs> Jimmy Carter, I have lost it in my heart to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald Ford. Hey! Kidding that phenomenal powers against Earthling and interplanetary foes alike. The fabulous foursome for right against might. Ex-presidents. Does it sound like that, Juice? All right. Yeah. Uh, so, number one, it just... Uh, this is going to be so far aflung from, like, the weird things topic. But it, it, it just makes me so sad that political comedy is just in this like very reductive state because like the idea that it's like all right gerald ford nobody knows how to make a joke so you just have him go hey right <laughs> or or <laughs> chevy chase realizing he's kind of boring so now we're going to make him clumsy despite the fact that he was an athlete it's just funny i don't know it's so everything's so serious these i mean it's uh look uh, uh used to be that uh politics was grape juice now it's wine you gotta wait a bit and then it'll be good well, I'm, I'll keep waiting. <laughs> <laughs> See, they should have lip synced to Jimmy Carter giving a speech. And then, it oh, yeah, been... exactly. And then it would have been like, oh, that's great. Remember when he said a thing? Now he's saying the thing again, but it's James Corden doing it. Now that's what I call political comedy. <laughs> uh but it is, it is an interesting idea, though, is we're being able to map the brain more and to look at sort of what's going on and even see, like, when parts of the visual part of it getting tapped into. The concept of, of recording a dream or our thoughts isn't as far out as it used to be. Yeah, which... especially, especially if, in, in fact, I would say not only a dream, but, like, once we crack it on a dream, I mean, why not a waking memory? Why not you have on well, a helmet and you're watching this Coachella concert and then later you put on that helmet and you get to relive that moment you know yeah that's a that's a thing i think about is the idea of like if you had the ability to kind of go back to any sort of moment would that be really cool yeah oh. that sort of points out natalie wood's brainstorm that was the film where the plot device was they built this this sort of like dream recorder and there's a scientist working in this and she realizes she's having a heart attack so she plugs herself into the machine to record the experience of dying in the afterlife that's interesting. So you realize, like, take your favorite podcast, right? 
and realize this one yeah like there's four different recordings and you can experience it from four different or five different perspectives you you can listen to it and be you know the customer the audience but it's like how different would it be to feel every annoyance uh and and thinking of tagging things uh as you adjust volumes as bryce or uh, the impatience of Brian, who is constantly interrupting or whatever, you know, or, or, or. Those are horrible things. Why would any person want to live with that? <laughs> I, I mean, know. I, I, I kind of, I kind of love this idea. I mean, why would anybody, anybody want to live with that experience? <laughs> I mean, I'll, it seems to me like the closest thing you could get would be to go to patreon.com slash weird things, where at the very <laughs> least you'd be able to keep this show alive. Just a buck an episode. That's all we ask. You guys can keep us loud, live, and independent every Monday morning. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you could join the hundreds of other people who are doing the exact same thing. Oh, hell yeah, Brian. Head on over there, patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah, but it, yeah, it is an interesting thing because, you know, we, you know, Brian, you brought this up too a lot, like how we, we have a recollection of what happened and why we did a thing. And often it's a lie we told ourselves. And so being able to experience a memory in the moment, even if our own memories, we might be like, Oh yeah, no, I was really worried about this at this time. You know, like, Oh, you know, I had to go, I had to go pee halfway through avatar, you know, the first time I saw it and I wasn't really focusing on the story, you know? And you're like, Oh wow, this is different than I remember it. That's an interesting question. Like, like even if you had that option, to find out whether or not you were right or wrong, would you take it? Because, because we spend so much time investing in deciding we're right on certain things or, or that stuff happened for a certain reason. I got to believe that an awful lot of us wouldn't even want to peek into the abyss of the possibility that maybe, maybe we were just flat out wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's that... I think of myself as a person that likes to, that lives with uncertainty and the idea that I'm going to be wrong, but then I'm probably the moment that that illusion is shattered for me and like, no, you cling to this and you cling to this. And then I'm going to have to be like, wah, sad face. I'm a lie. But on the flip side, it's like <laughs> if, if you're stepped outside of yourself and you're just watching you react to a thing, it becomes easier. Like, like when you're watching a six-year-old have a meltdown, you don't believe it's really because she hates this movie. You inherently understand, oh, sweetie, you're just tired, you know? And it's like, and, and, and I don't know, wouldn't that be a gift that we could give ourselves to, 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 to know mm -hmm. that part of the reason that we're saying something is, has but, nothing to do with, with us being right or wrong or whatever? I think, I think the issue is also just how socializing our understanding of it. And I think that that, in, in all honesty, this is part, partly what, therapy gives you right like therapy gives you the opportunity to reflect on uh situations and say oh okay well that was because i did this and this was because i did that and there's different ways that you can you can look at uh, uh the patchwork of what you know uh, uh the decisions in our lives are but if you could do that on a more real-time basis or you could look back and say okay well how do i believe this happened now let's go back to the videotape and see where i'm right and i'm wrong then yeah hopefully that would be almost a more powerful tool to get you in the same uh, the same position yeah there's that that you know the value of theory of mind of understanding it goes on in other people's heads it can make you a lot more compassionate and there are different tools for doing that really good storytelling is certainly one way to do that and i think that i think that is so much of the problem that we're dealing with right now is we become Ex we're exposed to so many other viewpoints. You know, you you pop open Twitter for 10 minutes and it's not like when you'd watch the news and three people would explain to you the way the world was going. And 10 minutes, you have 100 different people kind of telling you their own points of view, but we're all kind of pushed back into our own. But yeah, once you have that ability to sort of just, it's why I love really good autobiographies, like really, really good sort of deep dives. It's, it's one thing to have somebody tell me, I'm gonna explain to you how the world works. You know, nothing to go read, you know, go read Feynman or James Baldwin or somebody else and just read from their point of view on stuff. And you're like, Oh man, now I see it from the way you saw it, you know, and so helpful, you know, be able to drop into an experience. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crucial. It's crucial to see the world from others perspective. And that's, uh, 
for as much crap as we, I think, rightfully give the internet, um, the internet has become, uh, uh, has to me proven out its, its worth on humanity because we come in conflict with everybody's perspectives a lot more often than we would otherwise. You know, we are less bound by uh, uh, geography and, and, uh, even certain things like class and race, you know, that, that has their own separating elements to it in terms of the real way that we all interact with each other. The internet flattens that out a lot. And, uh, you know, that's what, for, for all the doom saying that we can do about it, my, my point is always to be like, well, you know, maybe it's not all bad. Maybe this is just the awkward adolescence. Yeah. This is us growing into this is us growing into the idea that we have to do it. And also sometimes that is ugly, much in the same way that, yeah. that if we were to look back and, and witness ourselves in a in a moment that we're not proud of or a moment that we are proud of and then become unproud. Like like there there is a lot of reflection that we all have to do. And I, I think that, yeah, like I'm I'm personally the net good is incredible. I think that yeah, we're dealing with this people not learning the exposure to other ideas is painful if you're not prepared to deal with that. And I wish I wish sort of the gatekeepers and the people who are kind of the ones who are trying to tell us the moral lessons would be conscious of their own tribalism. And I think that's such a sort of thing is that's the biggest sort of thing that's frustrating a lot of the sort of stuff is that anytime you encounter another or opposing point of view is we tend to have this sort of tribalistic, well, look at this dummy over here, you know, or, yeah. and then it's like, great. You just alienated that person from understanding your point of view. And it's like, if somebody's a jerk to you in traffic and you flip them off, you were right to flip them off. But the fact that you flip them off retroactively, they feel justified for doing the wrong, even though sequentially it makes no sense that you, that happened as a react reaction. Well, and, and, and it gets a little bit double complicated when your job is to, you know, try to be funny or keep a conversation afloat or whatever. Like I, I look back over, you know, 12 years of things that Justin and I have said on various iterations of night attack. And I'm like, uh, uh, we can't have been right and awesome all of the time. <laughs> Sometimes we just went for what felt funny and, uh, and, uh, and that probably hurt people along the way. You know, in an alt universe somewhere, though, you were right all the time. Mm, we need Parallel to get rules. back. <laughs> get back. Get back to the world uh, where Brian and Justin have never said anything they regret. It's just, ah, we just go back. Ah. We just go back. We're like, yep, holds up. Holds up, holds up, holds up. Better now. That's called holds up. That's called holds heaven. Up. And it only yeah. happens after we die. <laughs> There is, and it's, it's, I think, one of the exciting things about the potential for virtual reality, and, and that was one of the things talked about early on, is to sort of show different experiences. You know, there was an award-winning VR experience called Driving Wild Black, you know, which, you know, kind of delves into sort of, you know, one kind of different of experience. And I think that that is, I'm excited about, as we use these tools for games and storytelling to start help making it easier for people outside of game designers to tell, I mean, game designers have a lot to contribute, but other people, artists have the ability to use these to tell narratives, you know, I think is kind of a very exciting sort of thing. And we're seeing more of that now. We're seeing more of that now. And obviously there's a potential for abuse. You can use this to radicalize and stuff, you, you know, is like, ah, the people of Oshlandia keep bombing us. This is how evil they are. Watch yeah. this VR thing. And you'll realize is you could get triumph of the will, or you can get extremely sympathetic sort of things that help you understand. But, you know, like anything, you know, the tool's up to us to use. So, yeah. Uh, wrong. So, recording Justin's dreams and sharing them for everybody. There we go. I mean, Jimmy I, would Carter. I would definitely subscribe to that newsletter. <laughs> Like, like that VR <laughs> headset, just like, all right, what you got today? You know, you know what's funny? What's funny is I don't really remember a lot of my dreams, but that one was very, very vivid to the point where I wanted to tweet about it. And now I feel like I still remember most of the beats. Like I remember there was a restaurant we kept going to, and I remember there was like other elements of this bizarre campus that was like, I, I'm sure an amalgam of Syracuse and other places that I've been to, but like, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it's weird how much that one has stuck with me, and I wonder if it's because I, I put it out. I made the point to put it out on Twitter. I think I think that's something we've talked about before, where it's like all of your memories. You don't remember the actual event. What you remember is your last 
description of the last time that you yeah. remembered the event, right? And so uh, the difference is you made it past the bridge of consciousness, and by speaking or typing aloud, uh, your you know your fading memories, you 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 created an anchor that became the anchor that you've gone back to all day long. Yeah, I I'll buy that. So, uh, gentlemen, what's your favorite planet? Sorry, b b b what? Blan planet? Who? What? Huh? J Janet? Oh, Janet I'm sorry. planet? Cr cram it? You're not up on the new lingo. Apparently, some scientists have theorized that planets could form around black holes, but because they're formed around the black hole in the accretion disk, it would be called a planet. <laughs> Uh, I mean, number one, awesome name. I love a planet. Who doesn't love yeah. a planet? Yeah. So Brian, apparently, I'm, I, 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 <clears throat> I love all planets equally, <laughs> and I'm happy that they're finally being acknowledged. I so apparently. They're looking from like how far away from the black hole this could form. And I guess there's different sides. There were some mathematical models. And I guess they're saying that like a hundred trillion kilometers from the black hole itself. So it would be way the heck out there. Okay. I mean, we're like, uh, that can't be right too. I've got, I'm looking at this number like, no, it can't be a hundred trillion kilometers. Cause I don't think that's, I got to pull this thing up. Cause this is one of these things where I'm like, I think somebody missed a number there because that makes no sense to me. But anyhow, um, a, the idea, though, that of uh, imagine a planet forming around a black hole and the idea that like, hey, this is your life. This is what we think is normal. You know, this seems pretty cool. So um, there's apparently a safe zone that could handle that could handle like thousands of them around it. So there's huh. a safe space for planets. Yes. So apparently, you know, at the center of our uh, center of our Milky Way, we have a big black hole. There's a big black hole right in the middle of there, right? And there could be, they say there could be thousands of planets circling around there. Do you, I don't want, to, like, the next question is, I ask, is there intelligent life on planets? And then it just, it just, everything about this feels weird. I don't like any of this. Uh, but, <laughs> but, 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 um, We've talked about dark planets before where there's enough energy that they could form life due to the pressure similar to the, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, the chimneys at the bottom of the earth. Um, but there's no getting out. Is there right? Like there's, the, um, there's no sending a rocket out of a planet. No, there could be. So, so you've got to figure out like your, if you have, let's say, an Earth-sized planet at the orbit that is orbiting a black hole, it's the escape velocity from that planet would be relative to whatever the mass of the planet is. Your escape velocity for that black hole system, uh, it might not. I, I don't. I would have to know like the mass of like the help because these are supermassive black holes. But at a certain distance, you you do have an escape. You even have an escape but, but, velocity but from there. If it's in a stable orbit of reg the same mass, uh, you could presume that on the planet you would have roughly the same gravity. And then once you escape that, uh, you if anything, you've got slingshot, you know, a, a vector to really fling you mm. out there. Well, there's remember, like there's an escape velocity for our own solar system too, though, because of the mass of the sun. There's this we have a solar escape velocity too. You can get out of the Earth orbit and go to Mars. Then to escape our solar system, you need a higher velocity to be able to do that. But it might be, I you know, somebody who's better could probably. But there would be. But the other thing too is that like one of the things we've discovered, like right now, is you know that whole we've talked about the idea that there's a planet X or another planet in our solar system that's pulling at the at the Oort cloud and those objects out there. So we've talked about before, I think, that the idea that it might be a small black hole, which our galaxy spins and our solar system rotates around the galaxy. And since the Earth has been formed, we've had like, since life has formed on Earth, there's been like four or five rotations of the galaxy, meaning Earth has gone all the way around the galaxy, passing all those things. So capture of other objects is another thing. So 
you could have a black hole with other objects there and you could get a star or somebody else that has a trajectory that's not going to get captured by that. And that would be another option to sort of have escape. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so you got a, an Earth-sized planet um, that is in a system that just by pure luck happens to have captured one, two, three, four, five, six, seven star-like suns. So you have various degree and a few moons going around. So you have an equivalent of day and night or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now, now, now you're getting me on board. Uh, th th this seems <laughs> unlikely, but very <laughs> cool. Well, there's going to be, the more we look, there's going to be a lot of very exotic systems and stuff. And you have, you have, there are probably, there are solar systems and stuff that have been captured by black holes and maybe be doing an orbit around them, but it'd be very slow. Like the orbit around your supermassive black hole might be a million years. You may spend a million years going around this thing. Well, and, and, and I was thinking recently about how our perception of time itself is fundamentally different. I mean, I can't swat the goddamn fly because he sees time different than me. You know, it's like he sees a big, dumb, stupid ape arm coming down. He looks at his watch, decides whether or not to finish Seinfeld, and then flies off just before the squash happens. Um, like, once you break time and you say something can live for... 3,000 years or whatever, I, 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 how, how are we ever even going to know whether or not we've encountered other intelligent life? Well, that's it's the key question. And we, we, we have ideas on how to look for life like ourselves, but you know, we don't even know if Neanderthals had language like we did. And we don't know, you know, we went to South America you know, when the conquistadors went through there, you know, and their polite little goodwill tour, um, <laughs> you know, they, they saw they, they were just looking some, for golden hour, you know, that hour where they got all that gold. <laughs> gold yeah. And, you know, certainly in the, you know, the, the collisions of the Aztecs and the Mayans, you could see these civilizations there. But as we went deeper into the jungles and explored deeper into there and see these these hills, these mounds that for centuries were just considered dirt hills. And then at some point, somebody looking at, you know, satellite photos and stuff notice there's a lot of regularity there yeah there was a really intelligent group of people living there building entire farm systems you know farm systems had entire you know you know had their government had you know city planning had markets had all of these incredible things there that eventually the jungle took back and those those signs were hard for us to sort of recognize you know we have signs of hard time recognizing our own signs of intelligent life you know you watch you know, you watch primate interactions. I saw a video, David Attenborough video, and they show this orangutan in a canoe. And the orangutan is by itself in the canoe using its hand to paddle yeah. along. <laughs> and then they show these other orangutans. One's got a hammer, playing with the hammer, banging nails into a board. Not always the right way. And another one is sawing a board, using its feet to hold on to the board and the other hand to work the saw. <laughs> and you're like, if you were better at that, you would be amazing, like you yeah. know, the end end of it for us. Well, I, I, I feel like we might get too diffuse on this subject. So, so let, let me bring back. We did an episode of the Modern Rogue where we talked about one particular article where we talked about the concept of how do you cross the infinite abyss of deep time. Uh, there's a we're getting ready to put a whole bunch of uh, fissile material, a bunch of radioactive stuff, all in one place. How do you make it clear long after? language has atrophied long after imagery imagery has changed and so on that nothing good waits for you here um because uh, 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 you can't even like a skull and crossbones originally meant uh, uh christ's ascension uh conquering of death and it was meant as a celebration when captains would put it in their logs or whatever and it's like if that if that changes over a few thousand years, how do you cross the gulf and give a message of any kind of message over a hundred thousand years? Brian Brushwood, pirate apologist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> put me down, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. like uh, Bryce just pulled up the, like, you know, the, the warning about nuclear radiation and stuff. How do you, you know, how do you put warnings about that? And that's historically, you would see that like, uh, you know, it's, you know, we talk about somebody brought up the book 1491, which is this description, you know, overview of like the of America before, you know, the Europeans showed up to the party and what was going on there. And just and just you know, the more we dip in, dip into the Mesoamerica civilization, all when everybody fast. was getting along and everything was <laughs> dory. 
Well, you know, it, and it, but it is curious because, like, you look at like the Algonquin, their trade, their trading empire and their market, like, you know, it was comparable to like the Europeans, some of the bigger European cities and stuff. And it wasn't what we had immediately recognized, but you look at what's going on there. And that was sort of the thing that's, that's sort of fascinating. And there's a lot of wonderful YouTube videos and series that are out there, like, what if this didn't happen? What if somebody else, what if the Vikings decided to continue colonizing? What if the Aztecs you know, decided to go further north, all this sort of stuff? And it is a, done by somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about. Those are really good, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, as far as just, you know, talking about, like, you know, the state of things before and the state of things after and recognizing them, you know, how do you have these long-term warnings? Like, yeah, burial grounds and stuff like this, like, don't go here. Well, that means there's something you 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 have something cool there, right? Right. Like yeah. like 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 the more ostentatious, the more <laughs> obviously like no, don't come here. You make it. The more like <laughs> seems pretty metal to me. <laughs> like, yeah, well, is, 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 is 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 part of that just uh, uh, updating like or or trying to make it as clear? Because you're right. No shout into the distance as clear as it could be now will ever really be truly heard in 10,000 years in the way that you want it to. Right. So it's like the key then is once every hundred years, somebody making that message clearer to the modern That's, ears. That was one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, proposals was to create an atomic priesthood, a group of people who were charged with only one mission, like, like long after, nothing makes sense and you don't even know why you're saying it you have one mission and that's to say don't go in there like yeah. uh, make up whatever mythologies you need to write down whatever sacred texts you need to create whatever religions you need to you have one mandate nobody goes in there yeah yeah somebody watched too much like last crusade um <laughs> yes I, I think that i think that 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 we're never we're we have no experience knowing how to make sure to engineer that so it doesn't do the opposite and i like they just like dig it really deep just dig really deep if you guys can do the work to get down here and to get to this stuff then have at it you know i guess yeah, yeah. you have that you apparently have the technology to you know you, you're smart enough to dig this deep you're smart enough to figure out why you shouldn't be digging this deep you know yeah, yeah so, put yeah, a lot I of dead that, bodies that's, that's, in there yeah, just have it like a secret, right? Like the idea that, okay, well then where do people dig if they don't know where to dig, right? Like, well, like that, that was, that, you know, that was like a big thing. Like you look at, you know, the Egyptians rest on this, like with the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Monkeys too was a thing too, is that you hid the tombs. You know, we know where that you're like, hey, look at this shiny pyramid out here that we put like metal foil over it. I mean, that's the thing too, is we, in the movies, we still see the pyramids with like the uh, the rough blocks when it actually had you know the smooth surfaces on it, and then like the capstone with the gold foil and stuff. Like what the pyramid looked like back then was great. Everybody's looking at there, and like meanwhile, Valley of Kings is where we're hiding our real secret stuff, and then hiding the entrances and killing anybody that helped us build it. That's a rough game. Ah, That's a rough game. Here's your you better get over time. Here's your Here's your safe room, Mr. Brushwood. Oh, yeah. Well, will I smell this thing? Will I tell you if it smells like chloroform? <laughs> Why, yes, it. <laughs> Man. Uh, all fun questions. So, planets, look those up. I think those are kind of pretty cool. Uh, I'll do uh, one more story. There's a, this is a tech story. There's a company called uh, Our One, and uh, they have raised, they just did a seed seed funding because they're going to build generate ai driven synthetic characters from real humans i'm okay with that as long as the real humans are compensated appropriately right like 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 do you mind do you mind if somebody makes a 80 percent of an andrew main but you get you know hundred thousand dollars dude i want you as my agent sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> Would have settled for an Arby's gift certificate. <laughs> price, I just what, what be would like. your price be? To just completely take my likeness? Yeah, or, or, or to, to have somebody, let's say it takes two weeks, they do a very thorough scan, It's and, and they, mm -hmm. they promise it won't ever truly be mistaken for you, but it's like 80% of you 
Uh, how much oh, it money wouldn't. It want? wouldn't be mistaken for. It wouldn't be a perfect likeness. I mean, not not if they squint and look like like a fraternal twin. Imagine a fraternal twin, uh, only totally digital. Forever. Yeah, they could do whatever they want with it. You I mean, will it would be, be long dead, and they will still have that likeness and could do whatever they want. I I don't have an exact number, but I think my ballpark would be two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. Let me get my check. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, you know that's that's a long time for someone to have not just your likeness but like the building blocks of your likeness. Um, I I your mannerisms, your default right. beliefs, your my uh, voice. Uh, well, yeah. think about uh, the, the, think whether about, or like, not you would tilt your head at a certain type of joke. You know, <laughs> when Again, you not use, exactly, would, but eighty percent. When you use like Google Voices or like uh, Amazon's voices, you pay like per word. There's like a like you know a thousand words per like you know I forget the the fee is or whatever like that. And that that will be a very interesting pricing model when you're like, oh, we want to have Morgan Freeman as our chatbot, you know. Yeah. And then every time you open up a website and have Morgan Freeman explain something to you, the idea that he's getting ching ching ching, ching that his cash register somewhere or, or is ringing up. At least his estate is, you know, his great great yeah. grandchildren or so on. Yeah. No, he'll still be around. We're going to preserve <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, okay, fair yeah, enough. He's, yeah, he's yeah, he's he's not going nowhere. Yeah. Uh but yeah, I think it's just a, it's it's a very it gets into a very interesting idea when you talk about like cuz we do we've dealt with this to an extent now with authors and having estates, we continue to write books set within their universe for that. Who's the and, who's know, the dude who's like long dead but he has a team that just keeps on publishing under his name? Tom Clancy? Is he dead? Her, Herman yes. Cain? Herman yeah, Cain, yeah. Herman Cain with uh, his tweets now, yeah. Uh no, I'm thinking of neither of them. Uh some other one. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but but yeah, that's a thing that happens, you know, and, and think about, you know, because also you think about like uh, Disney as a company, you know, we still think of like the, the, a lot of the touches of Walt Disney and it's evolved and changed considerably since then. But, you know, that aspect of that too, or you think of like, you know, Apple and the legacy of Steve Jobs and, you know, of course that was his, his, his advice, like his party advice to Tim Cook was like, don't ask yourself what I would do, yeah. do what you think is right. And and I think that was like a great kind of thing. Like, don't try to just make the comp continue to make the company you thinking what I would want, make it what you want it. But because he knew that power, that power of myth, that power of like, oh, well, we got to do what our founders said. And it's like, you know, like Walt Disney, like, yeah, Walt Disney was born like in another century, you know, <laughs> like, and, you know, over time, you know, we want to have different things and stuff. So, uh, yeah, if somebody brought like yeah, Frank Herbert, yeah, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, you know, yep. they still write the Dune books. So um <laughs> it's like they've never seen Looker. You're talking to the world's number one Michael Crichton fan here. So uh back up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Looker Looker was another one of Michael Crichton's extremely prescient sort of stories. And it was it that's was the, a that's great the one where they, they 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 scan the naked lady and she jokes help yeah. rape or whatever. Well, yeah, the idea was that they were they were basically digitizing all these like top models that like killing off the models so they didn't have to pay them. It was a very silly premise to be like, yeah, no, how about if we just uh, twenty thousand dollars were good? Oh, okay, cool. It was a very kind of like, and then they have to kill them off. Like, eh, I don't, I love. He wanted he had this great idea, this great sort of premise. He wanted to talk about the idea of digitizing characters and doing this. This was a book like Looker came out like nineteen eighty. I mean, it's just something like crazy early, but you know. First mention you'll hear of a computer bug, like is in the movie Westworld that he wrote and directed, talking about like, you know, this thing keeps replicating and we don't know. And the idea of these things are like, they, there's a, the offhand thing is thrown out there about like, they don't know how the robots worked because they were designed by robots, which, you mm. know, second order AI. So, like, that'll yeah. ever happen. A, yeah, I know. But uh, Michael Crichton, I'm like, man, still a fan. <laughs> that guy. We just have we've never had an author that got things like he did. Agreed. Legend. Yep. All right, gentlemen, picks. I got an old pick for you guys. So for a a heretofore unannounced and undisclosed project, I've been spending a lot of time in 1964. And uh part of that is understanding the landscape of entertainment 
Uh, and so I wound up getting sucked into a couple of YouTube episodes, although I'm sure, I don't know if they're on Disney Plus, of Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color. Uh, this was a, uh, a show that aired, uh, it was basically a part of, uh, really from 1954 into uh, you know, the, the, the present day, the idea of the wonderful world of Disney or Walt Disney's Disneyland. But, uh, this is hosted by Walt Disney. And, and if you, you know, for me and hell, I'm in my late thirties at this point, Disney was primarily defined by the theme parks and the animated, uh, movies and then Disney channel. But if you really want to get a greater sense of how the brand of Disney was built and how much Walt Disney specifically was a part of that cult of personality that then kind of becomes this much larger thing, then I think it's really instructive and it's really fun. The The, the production is just awesome. Uh, the episode that I got caught up into was all about dinosaurs and it just begins with uh, a Walt Disney walking through this animatronic dinosaur set and he's interacting with them like they're like they're real dinosaurs uh uh just super fun and and uh, uh one of those elements of nostalgia that i think really holds up he he was such a futurist and he used that platform one obviously to promote disneyland it was part of the financing deal between abc and disney but also because he was very much you know he made when World War II was coming around, he read an article in Collier's where one of the proponents of air power was saying that air power could be the deciding factor for the next war. Walt Disney had a cartoon commissioned and all that to talk about air power and why we need to build an air force. And then in the wonderful world of Walt Disney in the 1950s, he had like Werner von Braun on there to explain, like talk about going to the moon, what it would, how we would go to the moon and then how to go to Mars and looking up the, the space episodes. They're fantastic because he brought in real scientists. All of them had German accents, by the way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, we're just out of World War II, and now America's living room is welcoming these wonderful German scientists. That happen some of them have hey. to actually be Nazis. That's a, it's fine. It's not here nor there. But it was really, it was a very, really the power of Disney to explain stuff. And remember, like they made a lot of their a lot of their regular income was from doing educational films these animal yeah. films these documentaries and stuff and so the the yeah the power of education there was um, um, incredible and yeah, yeah I love it, it, made, it made me it made me like think like oh wow i wonder who could do this now because <laughs> there is an element of like gravitas but also the fact that he was a guy he was somebody that was a, a builder was was somebody that that wanted to bring the fantastic to life oh you like well you didn't like the michael eisner era one when he did the <laughs> uh, a bit of a quality drop uh uh you know the the difference in personalities between ceos and walt disney uh you know you're just you're you're not it, they would have been better off finding someone to play the role but then again it's like that's kind of the magic. That's the magic of a of a of a Walt Disney. It's a magic of a of a Steve Jobs or something like that. And and you can pick at it, but at the end of the day, they're the guys that are really driving the bus. And there is this weird charisma to them that you want to follow. And obviously, Disney was more of a showman. There is there are a few names you could flow from Neil deGrasse Tyson to Adam Savage to Vsauce to yeah you know, but but all of them. We live in an age where uh, all narratives are more complicated now. And now for every person that sounds like a good idea, there's somebody else saying like, yeah, well, but and, and also, about... But I mean, those are also kind of communicators and not necessarily people who've made a thing, talk about the thing they made. I mean, like this all like savage made things, but you know what I love is the SpaceX podcast now, or the SpaceX live streams, because the pe you watch them and you might, you could easily confuse the people talking for hosts they hired. They're yeah. all high level engineers. Except They're for, all except engineers. For one person. There's one voice that pops out and you recognize him every freaking time, and he's my favorite voice. Oh, uh not Normanal. Um, I, I, I don't even know in, his name. In, 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 I think in, I think you're talking John Innsbruck. Yeah, uh, but like yes. they're he's wonderful. Everybody but people love him because he's a real kind of guy. But you, the the younger People you first watch are like, oh, these photogenic TV. Like, no, they're all engineers. And yeah, then they all work you see them. And it's, I love that. I love the fact that Space Cat, SpaceX has a large enough workforce. They have the people the ability to explain stuff because then they'll 
they're like, oh, the RTC 101, what? And you're going like, I, these people are legit because I don't know what that means versus somebody, you know, you know, some dumb science explainer trying to pretend they're Carl Sagan. I, I wonder if there is a world where either SpaceX or Blue Origin or or something like that, where they would just do something like, you know, Wonderful World of Color or, or Walt Disney Presents, where it's like, let's just explain what we're doing and what our goals are and, and what the, 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 the stuff is in kind of a, a highly polished documentary series kind of way. I, I think people would eat that up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be, I think, I think we're going to see more of that from SpaceX as they start communicating about what they're doing, you know, and, and Elon Musk is, uh, Part of his charm is he's so off the cuff. You're like, you know, he didn't spend the last five days like Steve Jobs obsessing over every semicolon <sighs> in his speech. Yeah. Uh, but as these presentations have got better and then when they go off the rails, it's hilarious. Like the Cybertruck window. <laughs> yeah, he's smashing the window. I mean, that's because Elon would probably be the name that you would come up with to say like, all right, the guy that does the thing that also obviously wants to be in front of the camera, but boy, the difference between like, a Steve Jobs and a Walt Disney in terms of being a presentational showman uh, uh, and Elon Musk is quite a golf. <laughs> so there is that story about when Elon Musk was on Big Bang Theory because he you know, got him to go do a cameo and they have the set set up. You know, he told him where he's going to stand and all that. And Elon says, uh, one second, um, does anybody here have time to teach me real quick how to act? <laughs> <laughs> and and one of them is like, all right, hold on. I'm going to take some aside, whatever, and explain it to him. Because Elon's like, I've never acted before. What am I supposed to do? And, you know. I'm going to give you uh, three moves. You're going to tap your he, lips. You're yeah. going to furl your brow. You're going to nod twice. And then look over your shoulder. That's <laughs> acting. <laughs> Congrats. Well, that's like... You know, like with the case of Walt Disney, remember he was a, as a kid, he was a performer. You know, he used to go perform, yeah. do stuff. He did the voice of Mickey. So he had that, that showman background. You know, Steve Jobs, like, you know, my favorite story, I've mentioned this before, of like Steve Jobs is, you know, the head of Hewlett Packard sitting at his desk one day and he gets this teenage kid, like this 12 year old kid is on the other line going, can I, I can't afford some parts. Do you have any extra parts you can send me for my project? <laughs> you know, it's like, who are you? It's like, oh, my name's Steve Jobs. I'm working on a, you know, a project for class. Like, all right, because Steve Jobs, young Steve Jobs, just called up the head of HP and asked, yeah. and the guy gave him to him. He's like, do you want an internship? You know, and no, nah, I'm going to do my own thing. Click. <laughs> yeah. Screw that, you. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's a, uh, a, uh fascinating uh just that that idea which i i feel like is kind of retro cool now as as yep. everybody is kind of creating their own content uh, back then it's like oh it's took all these machinations of having the agreement with abc to do it and then nbc and now it's like oh no now you're everybody's in the tell your own story business yep other picks uh i got a pick um surprise pick uh i i i, I didn't see it last week, even though it was our assignment. Uh, but uh, but I did watch the alternate take, which I didn't care for. But I watched two episodes of uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. I liked it a lot. And uh, I think I liked it because it spoke a language that was unrepentant. Like either you got everything or you got none of it. Uh, either way, it kept on moving. And uh, I, 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 I had a lot of fun. I watched Star Trek Lower Decks too, Brian, and I have a take on this too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. I liked it too. Yeah. I, I liked it. <laughs> I, 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 I was, was, like, was afraid there was going to be a fight. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, let me tell you why your opinion on this cartoon is why you are. Um, yeah, it is. It is a like you know my girlfriend who's never watched any Star Trek did not get as much out of me out of it uh maybe both shocker <laughs> um but uh i i liked it because like the pacing was really good i didn't realize they were going to go for rick and morty level jokes but they clearly said they start off from the beginning like you know crew members getting drunk you know physically mauling each other uh sex jokes all kinds of other stuff and 
I I like the humor. I like the pacing. There's a little bit of kind of the 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 type of, the type of character that's the uber person that can never do no wrong kind of stuff. But it's set like they've set up some character flaws there and whatever. It's 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's body humor uh, in the vein of Rick and Morty, but unlike Rick and Morty, where you just have to assume everything that they say is a thing. It's it's a little bit more fun, I find, to hear them say a nonsense thing and to constantly be thinking, I know what that is. I know what that's yeah. talking about. I know that <laughs> I character. I know what that is. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so, so it probably gets an unfair boost from familiarity, but, uh, but, but I've enjoyed it quite a bit. I, uh, I mentioned yeah, I, on Spoiler in Time last week when we talked about it, because I've, I've been watching it for a long time, too. Uh, as someone who doesn't have like a lot of Star Trek knowledge, I can tell when they're like making those references and I don't, you know, get them. And so, um, and so like I can tell like, and it, and, and yeah, good, good for the show in that it does, you don't need to have that, right? You're just like, okay, that's another race of aliens or that's some guy from the shows or something. Um, but it, it does feel, it, I don't know. It's on CBS, so what else can you expect? But it does feel very like normy to me. Like, yeah, there's there's violence, there's drinking, there's bar I mean, it's, brawls, it's, whatever. It's, uh, but it's 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 go Teen Titans five years later. Uh, if it, but imagine you've read all of the DC universe and it gets an upgrade for all of the references they're making. Okay. Teen Titans yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I, I yeah, I I was surprised by it. I'm curious to continue watching other episodes of it. It's so like, yeah, I'm I'm like I I and I noticed like you see there is this collision now you see like with Picard, which I enjoyed Picard. Like I enjoyed Picard. A lot of hardcores don't like it not because their problems with the story structure or the characters. Their problem is like, ah, I like this for this thing. And you did a different thing within the thing I wanted. And the Federation's pure. How dare you? And it's like, <laughs> like, uh, cause it's boring. If you really pay attention, the Federation is this horrific fascist Marxist enterprise and it's time to take it down. So, so yeah. Yeah. Even beyond. Nobody has any property, Brian. Nobody owns anything. Oh, hey, 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 I want to go to another using, planet. They're still using money in the 21st century? Oh. <laughs> yeah, real, oh, money. And then like, how do you how do you pay your taxes on this vineyard here, Picard? How does this how, how does this work? You know? <laughs> Why do you need a military fleet if you have a non-interventionist policy? I don't do uh, yeah, I don't know. No, 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 I don't understand. Sure, a lot of white humans running this show for this <laughs> right, star we're, we're gonna we're gonna start attracting letters we have to stop talking now <laughs> I, suffice to say i like lower decks it sounds like you like lower decks as well yes yeah and another thing <laughs> <laughs> uh, i've got i've got a pick i uh spent most of yesterday binging uh, uh an older older i don't know when it's called it's six six years old now i guess uh a supernatural drama you might know it as the leftovers from HBO it holds up like still holds up is is really does a really good job at presenting a mystery and this is my second time going through it I, well, I did watch it week over week for spoiler in time all those years ago I, I I was wondering how much knowing where stuff was headed would take away from it but it sounds like uh like it holds up it it holds up and the what's kind of nice is that there's some uh there are some payoffs to the mysteries that are going on in the story uh but equally they're not like very like they don't like deconstruct here's what happened and here's why it's it's you get closure rather than answers and for a show that's this length right it's it's 28 episodes um instead of however many seasons of Lost there were. Um, <laughs> I think a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think they tried to hit that, that, that uh, uh, syndication, syndication 100. Yeah. Right. And uh, so, so it, it has a very compact mystery. Uh, there, there's not a lot of time wasted or stretched out. Um, and, and I think they do a good job of, especially in the first season, because it's based off a book and the first season pretty much covers the book. And then seasons two and three are original um, of setting up new mysteries and new, weird interesting things that are going on in the world and uh relating that to well w how do you handle grief how do you handle grief on a mass scale when you know the well, and, the uh, planet would never experience this much grief other than having this event happen there's definitely a long meditation on like who do you believe in a world where 
everybody has witnessed the unbelievable. You right. Know? And and uh, uh, yeah, whether there, you, how do, how do you tell a charlatan in that world? Right. There's a a, a good there's a good good sentiment from uh, an early season two episode that I was just watching where, um, uh, uh oh. And Harry no, I forgot it. No, no, no. I the the basic idea it was like the doctor. So everyone, so the whole uh, the whole conflict point is like at three years ago before the show starts, two percent of the entire Earth's population disappears, and uh, these researchers say, "Hey, we want to buy your house because a lot of people left in the same place, and we think it's 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 tied to geography." geography. And uh, the homeowner goes, "Well, why would I?" well who cares so what you find that out so what and they say well if it happens again then we'll know and and she goes well why would it happen again and they say well why wouldn't it happen again and so i don't know it's, and if it's, they left maybe there's a place where they are and it's or, like and then that's sort well, of like I've, and and so there's there's a lot of really interesting things there um in the leftovers so that's a, a strong wreck i'll I'll check it out because I've been hearing hearing that despite because I never got into it because I knew the novel didn't have a resolution to it. And I'm one of these people when you tell me this this amazing premise and if like I want to watch people either die trying to figure out what it is or we figure out what it is, you know, like I don't mind open ended mysteries as long as people realize this is a thing that changes everything about us. Yeah. But I'm looking. I'll check it out. There, there's I, a payoff. I, I, will I will say, say that there's the an time, answer, but there's a payoff yeah, to it. Com, coming out like like you could decide whether or not you think they're right or wrong, but but there's definitely an answer that is handed okay, to I'll, you by by the okay. end. Yeah. And right, cool. and and we'll I was satisfied out. with the answer. I was comfortable with. It. Yeah. And okay, and cool. only twenty eight episodes. All right, no more. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, the leftovers on HBO HBO Max also. Uh, since Brian stole my pick, that was actually my pick, Ooh. Brian. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pick another thing, which was I checked this out on Apple TV, which is Ted Lasso. You oh, was that good? This? I mean, I guess you're picking it. So it is It is a very, uh, you know, kind of a low-key sort of story as uh, uh, Jason uh, Sudeikis. How do you say his name? Sudeikis. 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 Yeah, Jason Sudeikis. You know who's always great. He, you know, he plays a American football coach who gets hired to come coach a British football team. Obviously, you know, soccer as we say here, and it's it's a very sort of interesting premise. He's just kind of this. The accent kind of gets to me a little bit, but he's this very you know happy go lucky kind of guy, but supposed to be a really good coach, you know, and sort of this you know kind of a neat premise of a guy all of a sudden you know being put into an entirely different environment there. Um, I enjoyed it. He's likable. Everybody's likable. It's a neat little sort of spin on, hey, let's take a look at this culture, what's different about it, et cetera. So they put three episodes out there, and we just watched all three in a row because we're like, oh, we enjoyed this. you know. So. Nice. I, I I saw, uh, I guess, a trailer for it or something. I think I think it's a really cute concept, so I'm glad to hear that it like pays off or that well, it's good. Well, I'm only good. three episodes in. We'll yeah. see. You yeah. know, their Apple yeah. TV's doing their... Watch the first three, then see where. Like I never, um, I never, yeah, I never finished for all mankind because like I did, they did the first three, and then I got into a couple more, and then I'm like, is this all going to be like Guns on the Moon? I'm like, is this, is this, this is what this show is going to be? It's like you know, space guns, or I'm like, ah. I was actually just was thinking like, about starting yeah. for all mankind, yeah. <laughs> because it, yeah, you know, the upgrade that everything gets when it's been when it's bingeable. Well, yeah, it's funny. Whenever there's those things, I just always remember this uh, Saturday Night Live sketch where they would have uh, other people that auditioned for Pulp Fiction, and it was Burt Reynolds in the uh, in the Samuel L. Jackson role, and he just like he's doing the Royale with cheese monologue, uh, Norm Macdonald doing Burt Reynolds, and then yeah. he just he's like, "Cut! This whole movie gonna be about burgers, Quentin." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's whenever there's a thing where it's like oh is this whole thing it's gonna be about guns on the moon i just think like so picture gonna be about burgers quentin <laughs> yeah yeah so i was kind of kind of like ah like all right like there's cool cool all right um you know uh burt reynolds was gonna be in once upon a time in hollywood hmm. yeah yeah he was uh on the ranch right uh yeah yeah he was, he was uh yeah, and then uh, uh, ah man, and then I think also, 
he there was somebody else that played him like played Burt Reynolds like in <laughs> in that time period that there still are rumors that uh they're going to break that out it an extended uh once upon a time in Hollywood they're going to do a four part Netflix version uh, uh that Brian apparently is has really looking forward to the 1 hour take of of Brad Pitt driving through old Los Angeles <laughs> I'll tell you what man look uh yeah once you get the joke you Take as long as you want on that joke, because I know the punchline's coming, and and I'm okay yeah. with that, all of it. I yeah, I loved that movie so much, so much loved it. I agree. I hated that movie. That movie I sucks. loved twenty percent of that fan movie. fiction. It's boring <laughs> fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, you you are actually you're really not wrong in that it is fan fiction and it's telling a very specific story that if you're not invested in it, then I don't know exactly how much you're going to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, the more I have read and I listened to again, the great, uh, um, uh, uh you yeah. must remember this yeah. series, uh, that goes way in depth on a lot of the background and also like where film was and where music and culture was in the sixties leading up to that. And the idea that like, there's a lot of parallels of like, this was the dream. The dream of the sixties had soured. And this was like the example the of how exactly people realized, Oh no, wait, we had a revolution. And really all it did was bring the most disgusting elements of society to the fore. Hmm. And, you know, and a great follow-up to that was Jonestown. You know, Jim Jones was at the center of the movement out there in California, San Francisco, all you had people like, you know, uh, Willie Brown, Jim Jones, this is great guy, Jay, you know, and, and you know, Gary, uh, Jerry Brown, the governor and all, a lot of Hollywood people love, love Jim Jones. This guy, what is because his ministry was this very, you know, reached out to all people and whatnot. And, you know, that's another example of like how uh, he was sort of the epitome of that. And then he's like, you know, we'll just go create, we're going to create our own little place down there in Guyana. You know, we're just going to create our own little, we can all people, simple, can all get together here. And then it falls apart, and then 900 people die. <laughs> mm. But hey, you know. But they saved that woman. So, in the movie. Oh, no, in, in the movie. Yeah. In the movie. <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. In the movie. Uh, so cool. Great. On that note, um, cult suicide ending. It's been weird. <laughs> Hey, that's a podcast. All right. I'm glad I'm glad you liked uh, Lower Decks. I didn't know if you you would dig it. Yeah, I I'm I'm a Trek fan, but I'm not like a when it's good, I like it. When it's crappy, dumb fan servicey sort of stuff, I don't like it because there's good stories, bad stories. And I tweeted out like, you know, the the new series Strange New Worlds, which is, you know, about the, the Enterprise right before Kirk. Like uh, I just heard that Alex Kurtzman said they're going to be more episodic which I'm excited about because I always said, because I, I tweeted, said Star Trek was at its best when it was like CSI. We show up, what's going on here? You're the, you're the science guy. You're the medical guy. I'm the go have sex with the alien chick guy and figure out what's going to place here. I mean, that was in Jack's generation was people solving problems. And I loved that. Yeah, and yeah. so I uh, think it's to that roots. All right, here, go on a break. Okay. All right, all right, here we go. Right. We'll be doing after things here in just a few moments, everybody, while everyone goes and takes a break. break. Yeah. Breaking news. Let's break it. Let's break all this news. Uh, Epic Games says Apple threatens catastrophic response in two weeks if Fortnite doesn't comply with its rules. Epic says Apple sent them a letter saying they're going to shut down not just Fortnite, but all of Epic's developer accounts for iOS and macOS. If they don't uh, get rid of the IAP, the in-app purchase uh, uh, policy by August 28th. Um, Epic yeah. has filed for a, a emergency injunction for that to not happen. Boy, do I not see a lot of sympathetic players in this fight. A actually, oh, you want to know what? I want to give a shout out to a uh, uh, Bryce Neshcom Castillo's video game uh, uh, email list, which I oh. am a part of. 
I thought your write up of of the the epic Fortnite Apple and Google thing was really well done. Well, thank I you. think I think that was that was uh that was excellent. In fact, I've been so caught up in the set that I'm building for the streams over the next two weeks that I was working on it and I read it and I was like, I got to remember. I, I was like going to tweet it out that like, Hey, go read this. But then I was like, no, I need to text Bryce and see where I can send people to it. If there's, cause I know MailChimp has like a web address thing. Oh yeah. Uh, and then I forgot. And so I didn't do it, but I really liked it. I really thought that, um, Thank you. I, yeah, it, it, it was, was it was a good it was a good thing. And it's interesting because I think they both like have really strong cases, especially like thinking it from a from Epic's point, right? Like, imagine uh, imagine if your phone was like a desktop computer, like a billion people use them, shouldn't they be able to just get apps on on you know? Sh shouldn't they be able to go around an app store? But then I if thought, you're Apple, I thought, yeah. you, you like yeah. own it. You made it. You the part of those fees pay to develop it. And and I, yeah. Thank what you. I really loved about it is that you wrote it from the perspective of either part, and you gave everybody a chance to understand where they where their mm -hmm. ideas would lie. Um, and also the 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 fact that either of them again are really like underdogs here like this is right. these are two gigantic monsters battling against each other and it's it's a story and, where like so many of the people who are just sitting and, and watching it like i anytime i see comments on it, it's like well i i don't care about apple but i want epic to lose because i don't like it oh, well i don't care yeah. about epic but i want apple to lose because i don't like apple and it's like i there are merit there are actual merits to this thing yeah, I think it's it's you have to separate the personalities or the companies sort of thing from it. And I, there was, I forget which it was like I think The Verge I thought did horrible coverage. I thought Ars Technica did like really good coverage because like getting into like, hey, they're not one they didn't have an ad ready for Google, and also they're not saying anything about Nintendo or Xbox or these other platforms. And right. Xbox makes calls now, you know, this other big platform, and and it's this weird thing too because the other argument I haven't heard made is that like. On those platforms, they did their twenty percent discount, which meant that on the like the V bucks, which meant like there was like ticket, like sort of a ten percent sort of cut that they're kind of giving up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I'm like, well, what what would be your ideal kickback to Apple be? Would it be ten percent? Because it sort of deflates sort of the Epic argument. I just. I would have. I would give them a lot more well, credit. Well, for what if they Epic wanted. wants, what Epic wants is to like run their own app store. They're saying that they're big enough and their success is so has 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 been such a windfall for them that they can support and run their own app store outside of of Apple. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, and I'm. And I guess it's like, and then you do what Microsoft did or Sony did, and then you build your own hardware platform to do it. I or guess is Amazon and yeah, because like there could be. Yeah, exactly. Because like that's what Amazon did with Kindle, and that's what did with their Fire tablets and all that. Is they just said, "All right, Android, like we can really do whatever." Google's like, "Yeah, sure, great. We're building our own store. <laughs> We're doing our own thing here." Yeah. Um, so it'll uh, it'll be interesting to see what this new development. Do we have a topic for after things? I, uh, no, but I love one. What was the new development, by the way? Though. So. Oh yeah, you, uh, you guys are out. So um, Epic says Apple will th has threatened to close down all of their developer accounts in uh, less than two weeks if they don't comply with the app. Um, so that means removing Fortnite, uh, unsigning all the keys, um, and as Epic says, it would make them uh, unable to continue to develop the Unreal Engine for iOS and Mac OS. Yeah, it's interesting because like, yeah. Uh, Brian, I'm sorry, you're gonna say. No, um, I mean, I'm evaluating my take and my take is, uh, that seems like a move they could back up. Uh, I, I don't think that's a bluff. I think they really could do that and Apple. Would only, yeah, would only be minorly affected. Yeah. Well, and yeah, so, I guess uh, Epic filed a, 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 an emergency injunction to stop that, but we'll have to see if that goes through because their basis yeah. on that is, well, we're going to win the lawsuit. And I think the, oh, I think the strong reason for it is, well, it really wouldn't hurt Apple in the long run if you did it. And if we found that we lost, then we would just pay them whatever the damages are in the meantime. Yeah, I just, I was, it was hard for me. Like, I get, like, you want to build systems on top of systems and platforms. I get that. I understand that. And I think the 30% cut 
you know, I could see a lot of how it impedes a lot of businesses and stuff like that. But Epic's take, the way, like, here we are. And, oh, we already have a video made about the 19, like, you already did that. And yeah. I'm like, it was so. It was a premeditated you know, uh, Pearl Harbor attack. Yeah, I'm like, where's your Google video? What are you doing about Xbox, Nintendo, and Sony? And that was a thing, too. It's like, okay, so it's okay there, because then you have to explain the difference between one's a phone and one's this other, like, well. Sure. And I mean, you know, like, it was less than two weeks ago that Sony pumped $40 million into Epic to get a minor stake in the company. So it's like, yeah. well, probably not going to talk about the PlayStation very much. I don't uh, think. Yeah, a little, a little. So, so do, do, do we want to go big world or little world on our after things talk? Up to anything. I, I, I'm, I'm down for whichever. Do you have what you, you have a topic? Yeah, I don't. The way you ask that, you're like, do you have a topic in mind? Because if you don't, I, I've, you know. Um, I, 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 I think... Oh, no, no, no. Just, just whether or not we want to, uh, in general, on, on after talk, we don't, we don't, talk about big world stuff we tend to talk about small independent stuff so i, I think we've I, got I like 12 listeners to it so whatever we want to do is fine <laughs> <laughs> um uh yeah any topic seems fine though we do we do need to kind of keep out by 3 30 central okay uh in the chat somebody says no one cares about monolithic monopolist companies if they like the company uh be sure but i mean remember it's having a monopoly you have one. You have to define what a monopoly is because Epic used the weird language. Apple has a monopoly on its app store. Yes, I have a monopoly in my books. NBC has a monopoly in NBC television. Wait, uh, and their argument weird, is weird that things has a monopoly on what we put on the weird things feed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think their argument is uh, the smartphone is so essential to daily life, and Apple Shh. controls fifty percent of that market. Right, um, and the problem was they're an essential that... service. Yeah, but again, it's fifty percent on monopoly, and also when people made that argument about Microsoft back in nineteen back in the nineteen nineties, Microsoft owned ninety six percent of the market, and there was no there was no other computer in the house. There was you had one computer in your house, and it was either that or maybe there was a Mac, and it wasn't like, oh yeah, I have my computer and my laptop, I have my phone, I have my tablets, we have all these other computers in there, and so it's like fifty percent. You have to go. It's fifty percent of well, the smartphone market, you know, and not this thing or whatever. So it gets to be, uh, yeah, and, and point out Apple doesn't have 50% of the market worldwide. Part of the problem, though, is it's like Apple makes like seven to eight times as much profit per user. That's the problem, is that Fortnite on iPhone made like $45 million and uh, uh, it made $3 million in a comparative period of time on Android, despite the fact that Android does have a larger install base, is that rich people have iphones and they buy their kids iphones and then leave their credit cards so they can buy what they want yeah um yeah. Uh, so did i'm uh, available apple if you want to hire me for yeah. your deposition <laughs> uh okay jesus someone texted me 911 i had to make sure that that was not a real 911 it's not. um okay so did we did we land on a topic do we do we uh, have an idea you know what you're gonna do? Uh, i think we could talk about building let's talk about a sort of a broader sort of thing about building things on top of platforms facebook okay like sure, amazon yeah. bookstore you know no, and no, then like knowing we'll that, at, uh, 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 no matter how big or small the thing is you're making uh thinking about the land that you're building it on yep sure yep. okay yeah all right yeah and remember we got to be done by the th by the half hour yeah all right let me catch you in in three two Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. <laughs> so obviously, a big topic that I mean, we don't really have to dive into here because there's probably a lot of wonderful commentary by these same people here on other shows. But is you know, this big the big news is sort of the epic battle against Apple um going on right now and epic the oh, ep oh big i see oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh. missed it damn <laughs> sorry <laughs> bad, bad rewind <laughs> um and uh, again that gets into sort of down the opinion hole of what is a you know business practice ever like that but there it brings up the question of epic's fortunate because epic is on a bunch of different platforms epics on on iphone they're on android they're on you know pc they're on mac they're on nintendo they're they're in a position now where it's gotten heated and Apple can, is starting to pull them from all of the iPhone devices. 
Epic still has other places to make money. But sometimes if you're a YouTube creator and either YouTube changes the way things are monetized, we're seeing people, we're seeing content on other platforms like Twitter all of a sudden that health commentary may not have been too controversial a couple of months ago. And now we have this concern, the genuine concern for misinformation and people getting pulled there. We saw Facebook, you know, Facebook is very much like Darth Vader and Empire Strikes Back. Well, you're not you kidding, know? man. I mean, like, like, yeah, like I still have not come back in any way to Facebook. I just, I, I don't trust it. Not one whit. And, and I, I don't know what it will take to get me back. Pray I don't alter the deal further. You yeah. know, you're like. You alter the uh, deal all you want. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. But for a lot of people, it's, it's as an advertiser, the thing is like, oh, I'm not on there. But like, yeah, I, I've spent thousands of dollars advertising on there though so you know uh on that part of it and that is that is the thing we've talked a bit about before about like hey get an email list make sure you have contact information for people it was a question that came up before was i think by james harrison was like as you watch like if tiktok gets shut down what do you do but um i think we could do have kind of a talk about like in your the position of growing growing your audience what are best practices? Maybe maybe we could do sort of a rundown of how we feel about different services. Uh, obviously, we all love email because of its longevity. Uh, however, that could really change. I mean, in, in a world where Gmail kind of picks who is and isn't spam, uh, and more and more people go to those services, and there are other services that behind the scenes rate how spammy everything feels, um, E even even email doesn't feel as safe as it did 10 years ago sure i mean even uh, like we talked a few weeks on or a few months ago on this show about the hey email service which uh, i've been using uh, very happily for, for for since then and like that just across the board strips out tracking so like even if i'm on an email list i'm on email lists and i read the emails those will never open as read in like mailchimp or anything because they strip all of that stuff out so as far as mailchimp or any of those other services knows it's like well we threw it down to black hole uh, uh who knows right right um and so like yeah that 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 is a challenge for email where e but uh, all platforms have challenges like that but at the very least that is the end user turning on or off their own experience Right. Like and, and and at scale, that can be a problem. The the issue that we face with uh putting time and effort into a platform is you the person that is trying to do a thing now become restricted. Like mm -hmm. now you can't post. And that's the one thing that oh beautiful sweet email. How we how we always talked about killing you would be our true salvation. And now we find ourselves decades later saying, Oh, simple, simple, sweet, free email. <laughs> oh, how I love you. So, and we all return to it as the Shangri-Las we built turned out to be roach motels. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess the, the, my advice and, and, and keep in mind ad, advice should come from somebody who's actually done it and I've not done it yet, but I can imagine driving my car at 10 p.m., turning on AM radio, recognizing the voice of, of Johnny Carson talking to uh, uh, Larry King. And, uh, and it's not the vehicle by which I am receiving their transmission, the AM radio. It's not the fact that it's over a podcast. It's not over whatever anything it is. It's that the people themselves have earned real estate in my mind, and I, and I suspect that that's what we should all aspire to do is, is, is to be, is to earn real estate to where, you know, even, even if they never subscribe to your podcast, they're always thrilled when you show up on the Joe Rogan podcast or on uh, yeah. uh, this, vi this YouTube video with Vsauce or whatever. I think, oh, you were going to say Justin? No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, I mean, it is the, yeah, trying to get, I look, that's one thing that's funny is when I flip through my YouTube, like, does, you know, watch this is you see smart creators pop up on a bunch of different channels and just pop up everywhere and just avoid, you know, just avoid siloing yourself. Yeah. I mean, ultimately the goal is to have as many people hear your voice as possible. And when they hear it, they like it. Um, the idea of, uh, we, 
we are still young in the things we are building and really even the platform's relationships to our to their creators like it's it's still in flux it's still something that we are figuring out because uh to this point with facebook and and youtube probably uh being the the two biggest that have continued to squeeze their audience and their creators the people theoretically making the content for which they sell advertising against and making new rules that box them in or force them to pay uh people still go and do it you know we have yet to see kind of a breaking point there uh for as much as the ad apocalypse creates youtube drama it doesn't create a measurable drop in people making youtube content for as much as uh you know brian you have made the decision to walk off uh from from facebook it's not like facebook is any less of a gigantic ad juggernaut indeed it's the opposite now uh companies use pausing their facebook uh campaigns as their own ad campaign like it has reached this perverse meta thing where facebook is such a thing is such a staple of advertising that everybody wants to continue to give money to facebook and then also earn goodwill in the mind share of its audience by saying we've stopped giving money to facebook for anywhere between five to seven days depending on when you lose interest in this story um it's it's remarkable it's it's insane there's there's no amount of pressure that these companies can put on the people generating their page views that makes the people generating their page views leave or even slow down. And the weird part is, is um, uh, for those who don't know, what you do is you put a, a little uh, targeting pixel on your your site. Like, let's say people come through scam stuff. If, if, if you've ever wondered whoa, how did Facebook know I, I, I was looking at this couch at that one time? Uh, the answer is, is because there's a little targeting pixel. And then when they want to, they can run an ad saying, hey, we know you were looking at this couch. It's on sale right now. Would you like it? Yes, no. Um, so, so weirdly, e even though I don't participate in, in Facebook, I, I still retain the option to do so. Uh, but, but I have severe... I don't know, sincere uh, ethical questions about how how interested I am in doing that. So that's, that's why I use a plugin. So I just walk away from my browser and it just searches through random sites and shopping you know, areas and just creates this sort of chaotic sort of profile. Wait, oh, <laughs> does it? No, I don't know. I just made that up. I mean, but, uh, I would like plugin. to sign up for your newsletter. <laughs> what you it'll make it through Gmail. <laughs> yeah, I do like the idea though of like, uh, of just, you know, and that's, well, that's part of big part of what Safari does now. Have you looked at, uh, I don't know if you use Safari, but if you click on the shield icon, it will tell you like the, the tracking history. If you go to, like you go to like, I go to CNN.com right now and I click on the little shield. There are 20 trackers right now actively trying to, you know, figure out like following you around. It's crazy you know? because like, um, I, I don't want to give too many details, but, uh, uh, apparently, my physical address uh, sounds like a physical address that exists in um, uh, Connecticut. And so all of my targeted local news comes from this small town in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and I, I, part of me wants to fix it for a better experience. But part of me is like, you know what? Sure. Consider me living there. That'd I, be great. I get that on, I know I would get that a lot on the PBS website, but... I have Google Fiber, which is not a big, a big ISP here in Austin. And so a lot of times they think I'm in Michigan, yep. uh, which I am not. And so sometimes anytime there's geo tracking with, with IPs, even just that innocuous thing is not always yeah. right. Well, get ready, get ready for, get ready for the political ads, Bryce. Uh, <laughs> uh, update, update. There is uh, this Safari blocked 60 trackers on the CNN page. 60 trackers that sounds right uh, by the way uh, by the way it's like the reason why scam stuff has the facebook pixel is not because again like like understand this the brian hates facebook does not want anything to do with facebook 
Brian on his site has a Facebook pixel. Why? Not because of any allegiance, but because Facebook made a very compelling bargain. Hey, for the price of just adding one thing to your site that no one will ever notice, we will share the most precious resource the internet has, data. You will get data on the people that come to your website from N Facebook. Not, Facebook not even will data, because I don't think we get data, but what we do get is access. Like I can pay yeah. money. Uh, like, like if we have a brand new product, I know like uh, if, if, if there was no pixel, I would say, I would like to pay money to access people. And they say, they would respond with, you can access people. Don't know if they'll be your people or not. And then, yeah. but, 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 but by having the pixel, when that time comes, it's like, no, 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 yeah. this is a very important message. I need to access my people. Then it's like, oh, well, uh, how much of the moolah you got? And then if you're not prepared for that, then you don't get to do it. Because yeah, uh, uh, online ad buying is like wild catting for oil. Like you are, if you have no guidance, then you are just basically saying, all right, here, spend a bunch of money. Oops, no effect. But then when you hit pay dirt, it's, oh my God, that that's a business. You literally have found a business if also, you find the right spoiler uh, alert, Part of the reason that I hate Facebook is because uh, guess what is a very efficient market. Facebook's ability to charge exactly the amount of money you would probably make running a campaign to those targeted ads. It's yeah. awful. I hate it. It's funny too. I'm like on a, uh, of kind of an alt news sort of, you know, power to the people, fight the man site, and they've got 31 trackers. Ha! <laughs> well, because by the way, look, uh, uh, online advertising is something that took the entire industry by storm. It is, uh, uh, th it is the advertising industry right now. And, and think of every bit of what Mad Men used to be, right? Client comes in, they make a fun ad campaign, and then they place it on radio, television, billboards, like all what they would do. That has all shrunk down to a, a fraction of what it used to be. What is What owns all of advertising is Google and Facebook. And, and that is crazy. The shift we've seen in that market is nuts. Uh, and even then, the idea of display advertising itself is shrinking, and that's why... Any, you know, you could be mom, pause, crunchy granola, uh, uh, all power to all people, the, the site. And if you're going to pay for people to make that content, you got to get money from somewhere. And if you're getting money from advertising, the biggest way to make money from advertising is tracking your, uh, tracking your audience and selling exactly what the, the, ad, the ads that want to get that demo. And well, you need that data. You need to track to get that to to even be in the game right now. We're only going to see more of that going forward. Well, and and keep in mind, like uh, you know, my wife makes a, a ceramic art that has vaguely um, uh, organic swoops and swirls to it. They're larger than you would expect, and that's what makes her art wonderful and important. It turns out that the consumers, the type of people who would buy that type of art tend to have the the similar set of you know 10 12 20 uh, vectors and so as a result like bonnie goes surfing on facebook and is just like is this person ripping off my work it's like no i just happen to fit the demographic of people who would love the type of art that i make and it's 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 insane it's Trying to group people together and figure out like where we fit is, you know, kind of the, every advertiser sort of dream of how do I make that dollar the most effective dollar? And that's one of the things too, because like, I guess talking a bit about the ad side too is like, I've talked to authors who are like, ah, you know, I want to advertise my book. And it's like, if your book sells for five bucks, you're not going to find a one-to-one -one place to advertise your book that you're ever going to make a profit for it. If you advertise your book to get people excited about it and to read it and to post reviews, then it makes sense. If you're looking at spending to get people on board to you as a writer and then buy your next book and your next book and your next book, then it makes sense, did, you know, and that's... Does it ever make sense to buy advertising for your artistic product? Uh, in, in a world where uh, uh, Justin and I have talked about this an awful lot, um, you know, uh, we perceive our goal is to build a clubhouse of energetic people and then announce 
now's the time that the thing is coming out and then it, out it goes. Um, but some people have come to me saying, well, I want to build a bigger clubhouse. And so I want to let people know that I have a cool clubhouse that they should like, like advertise my podcast or whatever. Like I, 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 I don't perceive that there's any value to that. Have oh, you, I don't have, know. Have you... I don't go, like, go ahead. When I wanted to launch a career as a writer and I wanted to get people on board to discover me, I needed to start somewhere. And I think that like, if you're, if you have a one-off thing, then no, it's, it's not going to pay off. But if I want, I look at the funnel, like I see what happens when somebody buys my first book and the percentage then go and buy my next book and my next book and my next book. And so there's a value to me is trying to create points of discovery. Like advertising the third book in a series is going to be dumb. Advertising the first book in a series, specifically if the other books are out there might make sense. But, uh, and also like, you guys have always had audiences. You've always had a point. You've always had, always had a nucleus to build a thing from. Yeah, I guess if you're looking to, to get started, uh, Bryce, would, would you ever pay for, for those first few listeners? I actually, when I was doing a podcast uh, back in Virginia, I, we, they were not a lot, but we did buy ads on Reddit for, a, for the podcast. And um, I know it got clicks, right? You, they, you know, every, every time you uh, promote a link, they'll tell you what the click rate and all is. I know that they got clicks, and I do think that the audience did, did grow um a, uh, um a small amount but you know podcast audience if they like what you if they like what you make they can be a, a particularly sticky audience um yeah. so uh you know we're maybe talking over the course of a few months maybe a couple hundred bucks on it uh but i think in that case like it did work um at least a little bit and it wasn't trying to convert people into sales, right? Like that's a completely different uh, algebra that I would have no idea what to do with. But for for that, I think it helped help at least a little bit get off the ground, right? If you're when you're when you're starting with zero, anything you can get, anything that might just get someone to, you know, to give it a try, I think I think can be valuable. So another thing to think about too is like somebody pointed out that like you know this Facebook ad targeting them for a demographic they didn't fit into is that there's Facebook, their business is selling ads and they have really valuable ad customers. If you're Toyota, you know, if you're, you know, you know, Disney or whatever, Facebook is going to have a very, they're going to have dedicated people helping you put together your ad campaigns, whatever. They want you to have extremely efficient ads because they know if you don't see your return on your investment, you will go elsewhere. And this is what, that was just the problem that Snapchat had early on because they were getting a lot of experimental ad budgets Then advertisers realized they weren't getting the return they want. And then they declined. But then Snapchat had enough growth to overcome that. If you're a person who buys ads infrequently, they don't care. They will tell you, oh, yeah, use this demographic. Use this whatever. Try this. Oh, it's not working. We'll try advertising here. And you're not going to get the same sort of success rate that, you know, a more a company that's more dedicated to that and a bigger customer. So that's the thing to think about, too, is sometimes we see really inefficient, like, oh, this group, why is Facebook advertising to this? Because that group that ran that ad, they were still paying Facebook. You know, Facebook still made money. What about you, Justin? Um, would I, I mean, I haven't paid for advertising on, on stuff. Uh, you know, we tried to buy ads initially with the contender and didn't really see a ton of, um, a ton of, uh, a return. What I'd always understood would it, when it came to, um, uh, of Facebook ads was that really like you, you need a couple thousand dollars just to play around to find out where your audience is, you know? Um, and that was just something we didn't have, especially at the time that we were looking to buy ads cause we were in the hole. <laughs> so we were like, all right, we're not going to spend more money to try to then get out of the hole. Um, which maybe we could have, and we would have had a different, uh, we would have gotten out of the hole faster, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, to me, I've never played in that realm. I've never played in that mass market realm. The stuff that I do has always been niche and my gut has always told me there's another way to there's another way to get to the niche. But then again, uh that might just me be me being risk averse. I'm I'm willing to willing to assume that. 
Yeah, I yeah, it's, I I wish I knew how much of this was just predisposition, like 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 me just already deciding in advance how it must be. But I don't know. You know, I, I think a thing too to think it is to if you want to advertise like a couple things to think about. Um, if I wanted to launch my book career right now, not just to plug a thing that you know our friends are doing, but like. I would be on Sword and Laser. I would be pushing books. I'd be buying ads on there because, like, that's just it's a concentrated audience, and you know it's a community of readers. And if a handful of re if your stuff is good, and a handful of people read it there, it will make it through that community. And sometimes that's a you might find there's a much smaller niche where you can make a big dent. Like, if I wanted to do, let's say I had a podcast that just did like reviewed like Star Trek comic or Star Wars comics. All I did was Star Wars comics, right? I would go buy heavily into all the other Star Wars podcasts and say, hey, here's an ad for my podcast. Do this. I know I'll get I'll get a lot of people trying, it, you know, and I know that, yeah. you know, that's that's an audience there. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we talked to, you know, one of our friends who had a small niche podcast who wanted to sell advertising. He's like, I don't have enough numbers. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, eight other people with podcasts like you in the same niche offer to bundle all of your podcasts together and go find advertisers. And he found a name brand company willing to advertise because eight small podcasts was the same as one big one. And that's, yeah. that's a thing to think creative is that like those ready one size fits all models like Facebook ads and you're small, they're not for you. You don't need them anyways. There are, you look at it like this is an example I use. Warren Buffett has a problem. Okay. Warren Buffett, <laughs> not really, but Warren Buffett, when he started Berkshire Hathaway, he looked for these companies that had like that were undervalued. He looked at their sheets and said, they have a lot of cash coming in, whatever, but they're not sexy by Wall Street standards. He would invest in these companies and he made a ton of money. Then he got to the point where he would just acquire these sorts of companies. But he reached a point where he can't find he needs to buy $10 billion companies, $20 billion companies or whatever. He can't waste his time on $20 million companies or $30 million companies. And there are a lot of those. And if you're looking to advertise, go look at a lot of these smaller niches and stuff. And you might find like, oh, I write teenage, you know, teenage, you know, uh, fantasy fiction. Like, go hit those Harry Potter fan sites, you know, go buy advertising there or those podcasts there. You could become a hit overnight if well, you buy across the board. And also at that point, I would advise you not even to advertise, but instead uh, uh, come offering content because those people mm -hmm. like, like, uh, knock, knock, who is it? It's content for free that you don't have to work on. Please come in, be on my show, you know? Yeah. Oh, sure. I think, yeah. When they're, when it's, you know, when, when that opportunity is there, but also like a, a, an easy way to be a guest on some of those shows is, you know, spend a couple hundred bucks on ads sure. and then like, ah, I sure. got a new thing coming. I'd love to talk about it. Oh yeah. We'd love to have you. <laughs> like, uh, so yeah, as Brian says, try to offer content first, but too, but like, like, uh, I don't even, like, I don't think, I mean, it, we, we ran an iTrix for years and we made money on magic advertising because we started it because it was an audience that was under advertised to. There was a couple, there yeah. was two magic magazines there. There was no one place to really buy online advertising. And I'm and I was, I came from my problem. Like I have a product I want to sell. I don't want to wait four months to have my ad appear in a magazine. I want to sell this thing next week and nobody could do that. And so we created iTrix to, to facilitate that. And it was a great little business. Oh yeah. Yeah. And also it's like, look, uh, you launched your writing career in no small part because we had this, we had weird things. Mm -hmm. Like we had the ability to say, Hey, uh, Andrew's got a new book out. Uh, Justin is going to read it, uh, read this beginning part of it, go buy the book now. And then that led to the whole audiobook stuff. But it's like, that was a targeted niche audience and, and it gave yeah, Andrew, something that I think a lot of writers really would, uh, uh, you know, are are would love to have, and that's a dedicated audience that would review things early. And I don't know mm -hmm. if I think Andrew's journey probably, without the dedicated weird things audience, I think you could probably tack maybe years onto the front of his journey. I, I think that he probably would have gotten to the place that he would have gotten otherwise. But I could see a world where it's like it's just going to take time to build that like no matter what 15 five-star reviews like oh my god that's that that puts you so far ahead of the game i like to think i'm clever enough to have used some of my other options for that but i certainly see that how this audience helped it was absolutely instrumental but 
there were other models I could have followed though. It wasn't like this, yeah. or I would have tried to do a different thing. Like we, we didn't lean anywhere nearly heavily as into the podcasting episodes and stuff as we did. I started doing a podcast channel of my own short stories, which had traction, but then my book sales started to go. I'm like, oh, because I, I just looked for points of discovery to see where are people discovering stuff. And, and I was either, if I wasn't getting it within the ecosystem of the Amazon store, and, and we used our audience here to drive people to do early stages, but there were other ways it could have done. You know, YouTube could have done a YouTube channel talk. I avoided talking about writing because I didn't want to make my product about my writing. But, you know, that's a thing they look as still underserved as somebody talk about writing stuff. So, you know, there are years is kind of harsh, baby, but I like to think that you know, well, I would have figured yeah, out other ways. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't mean it as a slight to you. I meant it as a compliment to the audience. But uh, it's all, uh, it, was, uh, it is. But it's the yeah. Having an audience is great. It is absolutely. But and I, I would say it's like. If you don't have our audience, you don't have. I'm, I guess what I'm trying to. I want to give hope to other people, saying, oh, hey, if you don't have this, there are other ways besides that. It's just not the only. No, path. no, no. But I think the 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 story here is not beyond is not have an audience and then leverage it, right? I think that the 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 story is find where your, you know, Brian is always great about talking about like the 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 story that the the customer sees, right? And yeah. so for a million different reasons, uh. Andrew being an articulate and uh, a, a super creative, super smart personality on this show, then saying, hey, now I'm an author and then having the proof of like, oh, this comes on right afterward. It's frictionless between the, the talking head part and then the creative part. Uh, uh, that was like, boom. It, it felt to me watching it like mm. this like seamless transition. There wasn't a whole lot more proof that you had to do to the audience that was listening uh, for them to be like, cool, Andrew's an author now. I love Andrew. I love what I just heard. Andrew is one of my new favorite authors. And yeah, and I would like, yeah, that's Yeah, and I would say huge. that it, it was a big boost. It was a big boost. And it was helpful that I wasn't trying to do golf videos. I wasn't trying to do yes. something that was so, so, you know, it isn't, but I would say the thing that I learned after that, though, was as I got more into the Amazon ecosystem, even through self-publishing, that first year of publishing, I looked at who my audience was starting and who my audience was by the time I put Angel Killer out. And I, I could see the bump from our audience with Angel Killer sales initially, and then I could watch that valley. And then I watched oh, yeah. as another audience discovered it, and I was like, oh, well, frequency there. You know, the, the, In books, I tell people, like, the, if you want to have a career as a writer, you got to write a lot. You've got to put stuff out there to have one thing and hold on to it. And it's like podcasting. It's everything else. Put content out there. Continuously put content out there. Yeah. Uh, so form. so we're like in the last five minutes. Uh, do, do you guys want to just rattle off like your four fav favorite platforms? I mean, we all love email for sure. Uh, I think I think Twitter is fairly unfiltered. Um, uh, uh, I'm not a fan of Facebook. Uh, I do like YouTube. Um, and then uh, what? Beyond that. I don't know. I guess I'm playing with TikTok. We'll see. Yeah, I like, I don't use it, but I like YouTube because if you don't, if you're not obsessed with the discovery algorithm and you just want a thing to put a thing and people find a thing and people can discover the thing, it's, I, I don't, the discovery algorithm rarely works well for me anyways. I love that. You know, Twitter, you know, as long as you're not trying to talk about the post office or COVID or, you know, rioting, you know, protesting. It's very it's tempting platform. to participate in the, uh, in the argument. Yeah. And it's, it's in that you look at where people are getting banned, you know, kicked off from there. Like I had, I put up a video showing when my mail, I opened up my mailbox and there was a box too big to pull out. And it was just comma because I reach in there and I pull it out. I can't slide the book. And I put it up on Twitter. It got the, this is sensitive label. It got slammed at this. I'm like, what the F? And it's because somebody's like, he's making a political commentary about the post office. I'm like, no, the box is too big. Like, 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 <laughs> I am, I am, that is not that my got, fight. That got labeled? That got labeled? Yep. Oh my yep. God, that is yep. really funny. No, that was, it was literally just like, it was physical comedy. It was, it was, you know, uh, just like, you know, oops, I can't get the thing out. That's hilarious. Yeah, so. I also think, like, if we're not talking about, like, you know, uh banner ads or or uh uh 
conversion, you know, conversions into sales. Like I, I brought up on the show before, but I think like Discord is like a is a quiet platform that a lot of people don't even recognize as social media, right? Um, only because it has a little bit more of a buy-in. It is a little deeper, um, right? You have their chat rooms, and each room has its own rooms and direct messaging, multiple servers. But I think if you're looking to grow an audience, again, not maybe not necessarily to directly get sales but i think if you're building if you're looking to build a community like i think discord is a really strong alternative Uh, people love facebook and facebook groups and i think those definitely have a lot of features that are good for that but don't count out discord either uh yeah discord is great in terms of community building i don't know if there's anything that that can harness your hardcore audience and the more people you get in there the better um that is, you know, of course, at some point, maybe they get acquired by Facebook and flip the switch and charge you $50 per server or whatever Ugh. per month. But uh, uh, for right now, everything looks great. <laughs> <laughs> just Justin's yeah. like reverse Nostradamus. <laughs> he portrays like yeah, I, just how awful it's going to get. <laughs> I, 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 I don't do much on it, but Twitch twitches i think they, they're building a monetization they, they looked at a lot of the problems of the growing pains of monetization and stuff that youtube had and i think that twitch is trying to solve a lot of problems and i've told i've told other people looking to start platform like video stuff i'm like consider twitch like just consider twitch i, I say consider it but i do think twitch is in a position where with mixer out of the way like some of those terms on twitch are getting a little onerous. you would know better than i you, would know, better than uh, you I. know like if people could pay five dollars to subscribe to you and directly pay you twitch takes half of that in almost every case or if you cheer bits right you get all of the bits but then the user pays like a surcharge when they're buying bits so if you buy like eight dollars worth of bits you may end up paying like ten dollars so there's there are there are costs associated with that stuff and and it's worth looking into that um it's worth looking into all that. Yeah, no, I hear you. I guess I'd say that as far as having a monetization thing that's approachable to like the average person, it's kind of the only yeah. game right now. And sure. And 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 right now it's like if you've got time, you've got effort, and you've got talent, then it's fairly easy to get a, a affiliate status, and that's how you can uh, make money from your audience. Um, you know, it, they, I think that they have they have put time and effort into trying to make this an approachable platform, which was always its biggest hurdle because doing a live stream on Twitch is way more annoying than doing a live stream on Facebook or Instagram where you can just go on your app, say, boop, go live and you're, and you're good. Twitch is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Coming next week, Justin's new video platform. Boop. (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, and I also, let me just say, I, I speak no ill of Twitch as, uh, (laughs) uh, that is that is a family part of the family business. <laughs> cool. So, well, and I would say as a writer, just for writing in general, like I think Kindle Unlimited. I've mentioned this before. This is a platform where people who play, pay for the Kindle Unlimited they pay a flat fee per month, and they can read unlimited numbers of books that are on there. If you're trying to get your writing out there and you want to write novellas or serialization sort of stuff, it is a great platform because basically it's friction free. If I want to read your stuff, I don't have to pay you anything. I just pay this general fund that then gets distributed to you. And uh, I think I think it's easier to build up a career as a writer now than it was before, but I don't think enough people have the willpower to sort of do the work. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Any picks? Uh, mm. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Ruby. Did I show you? This is, a, I just got this. Uh, As a, oh, it's a like a hypercolor Rubik's Cube. That's it's cute. A, it's a Rubik's Cube that looks like, oh, it's yellow, and then it changes the oh, color. Oh, that's awesome. That's fun. Yeah, it's sort of. That is like, a psychological oh, torture. This was by <laughs> the same guy that made the, the 33 layer Rubik's Cube. Hmm. So he came up with this new brain thing. So it's a Rubik's cube that changes color from different angles, which is cool. Terrifying. So I will not be solving that. <laughs> so, all right, gentlemen. It's been after. Hey, there we go. Maybe months, <laughs> maybe, maybe weeks. Years was too much. I was, I was being a little hyperbolic there. I apologize. It's fine. <laughs>
<laughs> I was like, how are we going to give hope to people who don't have podcast platforms? No, no, no. I just think it's a lot of the advice you give where it's like, hey, if you have five friends that you can count on to give you a five-star review on something, that puts you ahead of the game. Yeah. All right. We are going to uh, go offline. The guys will be back in about a half hour to do happy hour. Uh, everybody follow Andrew Main on Twitter. Keep an eye out for those periscopes. Uh, yeah, I'll probably do one right now. Yeah, nice. Later. Have everyone have a good cool. rest of your Monday. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.